Ding, ding, ding. Welcome back, everybody. It is another beautiful day in the A, as you all know. And I am Trey Amazing, your favorite part-time stripper, part-time pastor, but full-time dating commentator. And this is Ringside's very own Corner Confessions. Today, we have best-selling author of the book, Dear Alpha Female. It's not him, it's you. Originally from Ohio, but she is making major boss moves right here in the A, and she's steady dripping pure uncut black girl magic. <laughs> Coming into the ring today, we have none other than the epically phenomenal Crystal Jordan. Welcome. That's what Thank I'm talking you. about. That's what I'm talking about. Indeed, indeed. So, Miss Jordan, you've been making your rounds on social media. Um, you're getting called from, you know, you got, I got an opportunity to see you um, with Ebony Williams, who, you know, in and of herself, talking about relationships, she was kind of in some hot water <laughs> uh, last year about the whole, I won't date a bus driver, but I did him if he owns the, owns the, the company. Owns the company. So mm -hmm. um, I definitely had to check out that interview and it didn't disappoint. I mean, you've been certainly making your rounds. You've been in demand. You know, you, you've become, now, would you define or would you regard yourself as like a relationship expert or someone, you know, who, you know, you feel like you have a higher level of expertise when it comes to relationships? Uh, I think that I don't like the term relationship expert. I think mm -hmm. that term, because I think relationships are very different. So there's no one that's able to give you exact, it's not an exact science. I do think I'm a relationship analyst, right? And I consider myself um, like a dating coach because I am a writer first. And I've interviewed, I started this about, about seven years ago. I started interviewing people on relationships. I talked to reality stars. There's a lot of dating relationships, um, dating relationship shows. So I started interviewing people on the shows and talking to people about relationships. And so I think what I've done is kind of taken a collective look at the issues that we see and the behavior that we see um, the majority playing out specifically in the in our community right mm -hmm. and so I definitely consider myself a relationship analyst and I think the more I talk to people and the more I I've gone through therapy and seen even how my experience has played out in the work that I do I think it definitely has given me a deeper understanding of relationships and what some of the biggest issues uh, that we face in them are indeed indeed I like that so I mean and I and you know what and the funny thing is like you I don't like that term, you know, relationship expert. Yeah. I, I'm grossed out by it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and it's just, I, I had to say that because when you said it, I'm like, I'm the same way. I'm like, yeah. okay, every man or woman who's regarded as a relationship expert, I'm like, they, they just somebody with an opinion. Most of them are not in great relationships themselves. Right. Which is ridiculous. Um, but I think, and even when I was writing, when I was single and I was, I would write, you know, I was a relationships editor. So that's mm. my official title for rolling out. I'm a relationships editor and I talk about women's issues. So those are my beats for the magazine. So in that regard, I'm an expert in the fact that I know how to write about relationships. But a lot of times the people that are advising others have horrible relationships of their own or not even in relationships. They're just watching outside the window. And I think that's part of the problem. You know? Right. No, I mean, I, I kind of liken it to a barber with nappy hair or <laughs> a doctor that smokes yeah you know what i mean like yeah. okay yeah you you know some of them can preach that great game but their home lives are you know leaves a lot to be desired but i think it's even different than that because with a barber he probably knows he knows how to actually get in there and do his hair he just chooses not to mm. but i think a lot of relationship experts a lot of them haven't had real time in relationships and are not haven't been through one that they've actually been able to use some of the information that they're giving out some of the advice that they're doling out have you been able to use it in real time and if you haven't then it's almost like a person trying to a barber trying to put in a weed and he doesn't he's talking about it because he understands it from a literal sense but an actual when you talk about actually doing it from the from the reality and the, 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 the connotative application of it is not there right no i agree um and, and you know i think that's the reason why today's topic is so important because um i did you know what i'll just say this from my own observation i don't credit it's not like steve harvey was the first mm -hmm. but i do feel like in whatever year that that 
you know, book. You think know. like a man. Yeah, think yeah. like a man. Act like a woman. Yeah, I think I forgot what year that came out. Two thousand nine or eleven or whatever. But I do credit him with ushering in a whole new class of overnight relationship experts <laughs> and gurus, people who ain't never had a successful relationship, ain't never been out here actually living it. But mm -hmm. you know, everybody's jumping on the bandwagon and right. after him. You know, all these podcasts, radio shows, this and third. And that's why I think today's topic is so important. Because really what inspired this topic was, and I'm pretty sure you've seen this on social media, at the end of 2023, you know, you've seen those polls, you know, going into 2024, what are some things that we need to leave behind mm -hmm. in the year 2023? Mm -hmm. I've seen mm -hmm. a handful of polls from, you know, different people on my social media. And every single time in the top three, Sometimes number one, sometimes number two, sometimes number three. And the top three is usually right. leave behind relationship, you know, podcasts. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a case of people have just gotten, if people are just over it, if the market has gotten overly saturated. But, you know, in your opinion, do you think the market is overly saturated? Do you think that there are way too many people, mm -hmm. you know, who, are, who didn't go to school for this, who, who don't have credentials, who don't have any kind of certification just basically getting on the mic mm -hmm. and giving out their opinion but being hailed as relationship experts do you think the market is just overly saturated mm -hmm. with you know these men and women i think that the mar i think that first of all the market is overly saturated with people talking mm -hmm. period everyone is talking specifically after 2020 um I, you know i think <laughs> there are a lot of things that happened number one is that people we couldn't go out and so people started we are able to use technology to speak to people across the world. And so I think that it's not just in the relationship space. I think it's in every space people are just talking. So, yes, everyone is talking and everyone feels like they're an expert on everything. Because if you have a phone, you know, <laughs> and you can get online, then you can, you know, you can be an expert, at, at least in your own eyes. So I do think that's the issue. But I think my problem with the relationship podcast, and I actually... Um, it's kind of weird because I do have a conversation on relationships on social media, but I think the problem is a lot of those podcasts are geared towards ratings, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're geared towards ratings, you're trying to say things that are going to go viral. And the things that you say that go viral are not necessarily the things that are actually going to make people better. It's the thing that's going to get an emotional response. And so a lot of people are catering to getting an emotional response out of people by saying things that are hateful or saying things that invoke pain or saying things that invoke uh, trauma, past trauma, and they're focused on that. And so when you do that, that circulates and that's toxic. And that's why really the social media environment and social media conversation on relationships is very toxic because we have people focusing on pain points that are going to get emotions high and are going to cause you to get a lot of views and a lot of engagement but it's not a lot of healing. And I think that is the biggest issue, is the things that make us go ah and ooh are not the things that make us heal and that um, actually push us forward. And so I think in every conversation, be it race relations or sexuality, um, you know, relationships between um, men and women or relationships between same-sex relationships, just friendships, the things that we're talking about and we're celebrating on social are the things that are actually going to make those things worse because they are the things that make us angry, the things that make us, you know, that get a response out of us. And um, there's very little, it's not, it's not exciting to talk about the, the boring healing part, right? That's mm. the work that nobody wants to do. And so that is why we have an environment that is extremely toxic and extremely triggering, as people say, because you can turn on social media open up Instagram and see something that pisses you off, right, about the opposite sex, because you've gone through that. You see something that relates to how you felt, and you don't get information on how to deal with it, but you get riled up behind something that's a, that's a painful point for you. And so that's what people are doing. They're playing on people's pain, people's fear, people's trauma, and they're using that to make their pages blow up. You know what? First off, I need you to go ahead at this moment expeditionally and drop the mic. Um, somebody, we need to we need to pass the plate because that was that was a whole off and a half. At the end of the day, because you actually said some things that I really didn't think about but makes so much sense. Like a hundred percent of what you said makes, you know, logical sense. Because at the end of the day you're right. You know, to to log in, I don't care if it's TikTok or Instagram or Facebook and someone talk about 
healing, you know, forgiving yourself, forgiving, you know, understanding or addressing childhood trauma, all these things that can contribute to relationships, that's boring. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna waste my time on my on my data plan. Listen, I want something that's gonna rile me up. Yeah. Because any day, no matter who you are, regardless of how conservative or liberal you are concerning dating, relationships, gender roles, if you get on your smartphone, you can find a podcaster that's either going to vehemently disagree with you mm-hmm. or fervently affirm and agree. Affirm and agree, absolutely. And I think that's why people don't take accountability. Mm-hmm. And that's really what my book is about because I started realizing. You know, I'm a black woman, so my concern and the area that I am an expert in is being a black woman because that's what I've been all my life. So I what I've noticed and I'm not speaking about men of any, you know, because I'm sure there are issues over there. But when you are really trying to heal, you focus on what you can do to move yourself forward. Mm -hmm. And so what I realized is that there wasn't a lot of accountability happening. Everybody is pointing the finger. Everyone is looking at, oh, this is true. And you're right. You can go on there and get everything that you think affirmed online. And so as a result, there are very few people saying, hey, maybe look in the mirror. Maybe you could be wrong because the algorithm will align with whatever you want to hear. Mm. And so that is a part of the problem is that there's a lot of affirming and very little accountability. And as a result, we have people that are just hearing what they want to hear over and over again. If you want to hear that there are no good men, that, you know, there are men that don't understand and appreciate good women, you can find that. You can mm-hmm. hear that over and over and over again. And once you start listening to a few podcasts like that, the algorithm is going to send you more podcasts like that. And so pretty soon you're in just totally engrossed in your own pain <laughs> and your own issues and you're not going to move forward because you don't want to hear anything that doesn't you know line up with the beliefs that you have told yourself that allow you to lick your wounds you know mm-hmm. and if everybody is doing that then we're all going to be doing that and there's not going to ever be an opportunity for understanding and connecting and really healing yeah i mean you're right i mean that that algorithm is from the devil because mm-hmm. in the, the day it's like okay i mean the more you keep on clicking um these these posts you know that you know get you riled up get you emotional you don't realize okay you're telling the algorithm keeps in keeps sending you more mm-hmm. and before you realize you and your phone have created your own little miserable echo chamber exactly. where every day you get on there and you're just <laughs> mad about something because mm-hmm. someone told you this is what you should be mad about you know or i mean because at the end of the day um i don't know if you know if the people were mentioning or thinking about people specifically but it was you know across my timeline and it everybody had just seemed to be so fed up mm-hmm. with relationship podcasts like okay enough is enough yeah everybody with a smartphone has a platform has a pulpit mm-hmm. has a soapbox <laughs> and some people really i mean if you get on tiktok long enough you realize okay some people really need their smartphones taken away you, i you think don't we need to take it take it away or at least take away the ability to share it mm-hmm. i think it can be helpful and cathartic to get things out I don't think that it needs to be shared with everyone else. And then, as you said, the algorithm is manipulating us, right? And so that is part of the problem. But I think sharing things, writing it out, I'm a big, you know, I'm a writer from from birth. So I've always taken to when I'm feeling something, because a lot of times when you're hurt, you don't have anything to do with that. Mm -hmm. And that can become, you know, overwhelming. And so writing it out, speaking it out, those are helpful. But when you speak it out and you connect with someone else's hurting as well, then, you know, you just you're growing that exponentially. So it's a lot of hurt people talking. And I think that's what you see. A lot of these relationship podcasts, the entire conversation is built around one person's toxic past and Mm. someone else says, oh, I've experienced that, too. And then they come together and they decide, oh. I've gone through something, a painful breakup. I would guarantee that most people that start a podcast are doing that after they've gone through a breakup or because they're not able to secure the relationship that they want. And so they want to be able to talk about it and have other people, um, you know, pacify them as opposed to actually just doing the work, putting your foot. You cannot do the work while you're talking about it and influencing others with your toxicity. Like right? mm-hmm. doing the work requires you to stop promoting what you're doing and actually take some time to yourself and figure out why you are hurting. But if you're spreading the hurt, it's kind of like if you broke your leg and instead of putting a cast on it, you just started spreading the, you know, figuring out a lot of other people with broken legs and you guys all just had a round together. You're not healing. You're not moving forward. You're not learning to walk again. You're just sitting there talking about how deep this pain is. Mm -hmm. And so we wouldn't do that in any other situation, right? 
you wouldn't expect people that are all um, you wouldn't you know expect people strategically you know, or intentionally to to be dealing with depression and all just get together like oh you're dealing with depression me too me too me too let's just get together and talk to each other without help that doesn't make any sense but that's what in this that's in essence what we're doing on social media people are finding each other attracted by their similar pain and they're just promoting that and so it's a very unhealthy environment indeed indeed shots fired everybody <laughs> if you caught a straight it is what it is okay bullets don't have a name on it but it makes sense because you know again it's it's I don't care if it's Kevin Samuels or the <laughs> she Russ Seven Sprinkle Sprinkle Lady. Both of them, to me, represent uh, uh, extremism. Right. You know, very much so, to a point where it's more so toxic. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to say, like, Kevin Samuels had a lot of things that were true. But I say this, you know, I did a conversation on Revolt about him. Mm -hmm. um, when you take something that poison is very it's very innocently created right so you take 90 percent corn and you mix 10 percent cyanide and that makes poison right for you know for ver for vermin or whatever so most of it is good mm -hmm. but it's that 10 percent that is deadly and so i think that's the same thing with those type conversations kevin samuel said a lot of things that were true but he also was someone that studied the way people respond. He was a marketing genius. And he realized that if I'm telling people, if I'm telling men, this is how you can make yourself better, mm, that's boring. I may be helping a few people, but I'm not making a, a lot of you money. Go viral for that. Not going viral for that. But if I can sit up and tell women what those things are that hurt them, and as a man, telling women how you know imperfect they are in a society that is committed to perfection right we are we want to be physically perfect to the point where we're photoshopping ourselves we're getting surgery everyone wants to be physically perfect and i am gonna gonna zero in on the fact that you may not be perfect and i'm going to use it against you and that's going to cause the fear causes a reaction and i'm going to go viral and it's going to make money for me and the problem is that there was some truth in that so some mm -hmm. people can get mixed up in the minutia of the fact that there was truth there but it was packaged in a way that was very toxic and very hurtful and i think for all the the people that might have listened to kevin samuels and been able to get something from him probably pale in comparison to the people that actually watched and it actually ripped a scab off and it actually caused them to feel worse about themselves you know mm. because his goal at, at that point he was fed up and i don't know i don't know him personally but it's obvious that he tried all these other things that didn't work and then at the point that he started the the podcast the direction that he went in that made him viral it was his own frustration and very obviously his own pain right right and so that's what resonated with the millions of people laughing at someone else's pain mm -hmm. um met, figuring out what it is about that person that i'm better than so oh well if you look at the numbers obviously the the average dress size in the united states is a size 12. And, you're, and Kevin Samuels was preaching that a size four, zero to four was preferable. Uh, preferable. Obviously, you're stepping on a lot of toes, but that's how you get a reaction. Off. You're gonna piss. You're gonna hurt some people because mm -hmm. that's really making people look at themselves and feel worse about themselves. And people are addicted to feeling. Um, people are addicted to their own pain in many different ways. So self-deprecation is an issue. You have mm -hmm. women looking on there, knowing that they don't fit the the standard of beauty that that he was preaching and trying to figure out what's wrong with them like it was just it was it was it was an environment that was extremely toxic but unfortunately it's also one that was extremely addictive you know what and the thing is i tried to reach out to kevin uh for an interview mm -hmm. you know i found his email address because he wasn't living that far from where i live mm -hmm. he was you know probably within you know four or five miles something like that um but yeah i obviously i never got a chance to get a hold of him at the end of the day you know when i talk about kevin samuels he was my fraternity brother, mm -hmm. so there's only so much negative I'll say about him, but mm -hmm. I do agree with what you said. There were nuggets of wisdom that mm -hmm. he did speak mm -hmm. all in all, and I've been public with this, you know, as far as my opinion. I said I was never a fan of his delivery. Mm -hmm. I was never a fan, you know, of being, you know, that brazenly, you know, obnoxious and <laughs> being rude. You know, did he say things that I, in the back of my mind, agree with? Mm -hmm. Hell yeah. Yeah. He, said, he said a lot of things that I didn't agree with, but mm -hmm. I do think... I do agree with you in his sense, if we're discussing Kevin Samuels, 
he found lightning in the bottle mm. when he directed his criticism towards women because I've explained that to women like if you go back and look at his earlier videos mm -hmm. he was just as harsh on men mm -hmm. he was mm -hmm. telling men look you need to get your fat ass in shape <laughs> you, need you, to get, you need to get some money you're broke just, right but I think that you you know the lightning in the bottle means that you figure out what people's weaknesses are mm -hmm. and you zero in on that right and so men aren't necessarily looking for validation from other men ironically what i learned in doing studies about him because i did a couple of segments for him for revolt and then i also did a couple of segments on my channel about him and what i learned is that a lot of men championed him for giving them a voice when they didn't have a voice right mm. so he figured out where those pain points were and he he maximized them for his own you know his own mm. success i don't know if it actually was making him a better person i don't know if it actually was giving him the, re the re relationship that he claimed that everyone would want um, because even and you know people are people so I don't have anything against him as a person I think it's unfortunate that he left before he was able to grow because I think he would have grown I think with time most of us are able to grow um, everyone grows at a different rate but I think if he had more time to see what um, the effects of his 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 commentary was doing on his culture he might have changed mm -hmm. uh what he had to say but i do think that if you look at the way that he you know the way he left was so extreme just as extreme as his message and i don't think that it proved i think it proved that he wasn't necessarily able to find what he was looking for either right no i agree you know rest in peace kevin samuels yeah um he definitely in the, in the short amount of time he was on social media making waves like he did he made marketing an genius i mean yeah. some things are about marketing and some things are about people actually really wanting to help i mean he did that he, he knew how to market himself he, he figured market. that out yeah and no, so he, he it was a success it was success success in that way and i think like i said a lot of the podcasts that are extremely successful you kind of have to figure out what is your goal if your goal is to get viewers if your goal is to monetize your platform then which most people want to do that mm -hmm. then you're gonna then the the way to do that is not necessarily by taking your time and actually trying to feed people's soul and feed people's spirit the way to do that is to zero in on what is going to get a response and what hurts you and let me figure out how to get that quickly and so you kind of have to figure out am i here what is my what is my purpose right. and once you know what that is then i think you can move forward but i think that the viewers should know that a lot of these podcasts are not were not created to help you and to make you think and to help you get to the next level. A lot of them were just created to get a response, you know. Get a response, yeah. shock value, shock entertainment. Value. Yeah. I mean, that's what you know. Social media is. I mean, you know, you realize, you know, uh, for something to go about, you know, viral, it has to capture attention. Mm -hmm. And sometimes things that you know are necessary things that we need. It doesn't always work, you know. It's no, boring. it's going to have to be focused on either pain or fear. Mm. Fear goes viral, right? Look what happened to all of us in 2020. We were afraid. Fear is a great motivator. It's probably the best. Um, pain is also one. And fear triggers our our memories of pain. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just a great motivator. Love is a great motivator, but I think it's not as impactful because you can fake love is a, is a better, is a quicker one. Anger, right you know, yeah anger definitely but you don't i don't know if i can get real love right mm -hmm. because that's something that's kind of intangible but i can get a guy a lot of guys liking my pictures oh yeah that's easy to do that's really easy you know it, so don't i would, take a lot of don't take a lot to yeah. do it <laughs> so i'll you know that's accessible to me so i'm gonna go for what's accessible fake love fake likes fake friends that's what we're all into right now because it in order to get the real thing you would have to figure out how to deal with yourself and it may not be something that you can you know brag about on social media mm -hmm. i mean you know so what people are doing is really gravitating to things that are fake and superficial mm. you no know, i feel that i mean you know and that's the reason why i think that um you know it's I, some of the people who were saying and this is just my own diagnosis i think some of the people they were reaching that point where they felt like okay we need to leave all these relationship podcasts in 2023 i think people just got their feel and just yeah. they're over it they're over the Toxicity. I mean, you have, you know, from Charleston White to Umar Johnson to Sprinkle Sprinkle <laughs> to some of everybody, you know, yeah. and in all these, you know, satellite podcast shows, because it is so. I mean, it's so many of them. It's I can't hundreds, keep count. Yeah. Hundreds of them. Thousands I mean, but, probably. I mean, but you do have these other figures who are 
known or they get the most traction on social media when they talk about, you know, like, like Umar Johnson. You know, Umar Johnson is another one that I would say, okay, I have mixed feelings about him mm -hmm. as a dating commentator, but he gets, he's realized that he talks a lot about, you know, racial injustice and putting black people first and we need to have our own, you know, which mm -hmm. all messages that I, that I, you know, I can relate and I can agree with. Mm -hmm. but however, he tends to go viral and he gets known for whenever he talks about interracial dating. Yeah. That's when his and numbers go that. up. Yeah, he knows that. I mean, he because yeah. the end of the day, it's like he loves beating that dead horse. Mm -hmm. It's like, dude, it's an extreme, and it gets a response. Mm -hmm. And people figure out whatever gives me the response, what I'm going to do. And then other people say, "Oh, well, he got a response doing that. Let me do that too. Let me try." I would say with Dr. Umar Johnson, I you know I don't I don't see him as a relationship um, commentator because I think he does speak about things. He's more of a um, civil. Um, I'm not going to say civil rights, <laughs> maybe social commentator, civil and social rights is what he's focused on, especially when it comes to our community. Mm -hmm. um, and he's been doing that for a long time. So I, I will give him credit because he's been doing this for years, way before Instagram was popular. Um, I do think that he's smart and he's he knows what's going to make him get the response. And sometimes you have to do something to get people to pay attention to what you really want them to know. Right. And so it's kind of like when you are a kid and you, your mom needed you to take some medicine and you wouldn't take it. So she wrapped it in some and some jelly, like, you know, put it in some jelly or put it in some um, some jello to make it to where it went down smoother. So I think that sometimes people like Dr. Umar or, Dr. or a lot of, you know, anyone that even my um, one of my heroes, Ava Duver. Well, Ava actually does not. She doesn't do that. She does. She, she remains authentic. Um, but a lot of people will put. A message wrap it in something that's very provocative mm. um, and it's because they really want you to get the message if the provocativeness brings you in to get the message then that the end justifies the means but as I was saying I really admire people like Ava DuVernay um, that don't sacrifice and don't um, water down their message and they want you to rise to the occasion it's like I believe that you can understand this and I'm not going to wrap it in something that's provocative to, to distract you this is information that you need to get to make yourself better or to educate you on what our community is going through. And I want you to be able to swallow it without wrapping it in something superficial. And I respect people like that. But I also understand people like Dr. Umar that will give you that hype to get you to pull you in, to get you to pay attention to the real statistics and the information that's hurting our community. Indeed. Indeed. I dig that. And so check this out. You know, as we wrap up this interview, I want to give you the opportunity to kind of briefly well, you know, brief or however you want to do it, really want to delve into Dear Alpha Female because that is a very exciting title. <laughs> it's evocative because, you know, and, and every man is different. You know, number one, I don't agree that there is any man that can speak for all men. You have some, you know, I've been on message boards and men talk about, well, real masculine men don't want an alpha female mm -hmm. or there's no such thing as an alpha female mm -hmm. or alpha female that is masculine, or mm -hmm. it's an oxymoron. Mm -hmm. um, I disagree with that. I don't think there's anything wrong with being an alpha female. I mm -hmm. don't think alpha female is masculine. And I don't think it's a turn off, but I definitely acknowledge the fact that a lot of men feel, you know, yeah. I guess the opposite. What are, you know, yeah. as far as alpha female, you know, mm -hmm. what would you like to convey to people? You know, are there any, you know, in terms of misconceptions or, you know, what are some things that you want people to know in terms of, set, you know, getting the record straight about what an alpha female is mm -hmm. and the purpose? Okay, first of all, I've heard all those things that you said from very, very vocal men <laughs> in the community that have went out of their way to share with me that I don't know what I'm talking about, but I disagree with them. Um, and I say, I think that there are, I'm a big, I'm an animal lover, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, me too. I, I, that's, yeah, we, we have the dogs in common. Mm -hmm. I have a horse. Right, and you I learned. An I'm an equestrian, yes, but I love horses. I've loved horses since I was little, and I study horse. I study their behavior because I have a female horse. I've had. A, I've always had mares. This is my. This is my second mare. Say that again, please. Female horse is a mare. A right? female horse is a mare, not a stallion. Meg, which is I, a problem. It's Meg, a I don't know. Mare. That pisses me off. Meg. See, that's a very, very. That's a very contradicting, contradicting statement in itself. Meg the stallion, like, that and, I, and I've me heard, so bad. I but I've heard why. men say that, like, oh, you're looking like a stallion. I'm like, you realize that's a male horse. That's a male horse. And not only is it a male horse, but it's a male horse 
that is at his that is that has not been castrated so he is very sexual so a gelding is a male a male horse that has been um fixed right mm. but the stallion you can't have a stallion around any mares because he's going to constantly be trying to impregnate them so Meg, so, i need i need you to pick up a book and or, and stallions you can't even have them around other stallions you can't have them around other geldings like they have to kind of be by themselves because horny. they're they're very horny. they're very they're horny and violent um because they want their um the ultimate alpha so it's like anything around me i'm going to if i'm not conquering it then i'm going to destroy it so they will kill another horse so yes, that's true. That bothers me too. People yeah. call. Sorry to go off on that tangent, but no, when you said right. that, I'm just like, it just always bothers me. But it's, continue. It's, it's ridiculous, but you know, people sometimes like to live in ignorance. Um, but I've always had mares, right? And but, so a mare is a female horse. A filly is a young, young female horse. When she gets to maturity, she's a mare. But there are dominant mares, right? And so my first horse was named Paris. And Paris was a very dominant mare, which meant that she was a leader. Dominant means in the animal kingdom, it means that that is a leader. So that is, she is a horse that is not going to follow the other horses. She's going to automatically expect them to follow her, right? Mm -hmm. And and there are other other species have the same thing. If you look at lions, there uh, there's a pride of lions. There's always one dominant female that's the leader of that pride, right? Elephants, same way, the matriarch, you know? So if all these things are true and all these other species, and we know that as humans, we are um, a species of animal as well. If there are dominant leading ma um, uh, females in every other species, how would there not be the same thing in the human species? Mm -hmm. Doesn't make sense. So obviously there are dominant females outside of just saying it that on a scientific level, let's talk about what we see from a behavior standpoint. Um, there are women that are leaders. We know that there is the biggest surgeons in female uh, females in executive leadership positions in corporate America, and also African American women in, in particular are the highest uh, level of new business owners, small business owners. So That's obviously, true. if women are leading small businesses and women are in positions of executive leadership in corporate America, then these women are leaders. These women have characteristics that would align with being dominant and also would allow them to be um, referred to as an alpha female and also um, somebody that others want to follow right if it's, it's yeah. in every situation it, it doesn't matter it's not a negative term it just means that in, in every group you know if you go to a, a, a playground and you see kids playing there's going to be one boy that's leading and there's probably going to be a girl that's, and there may be different ones but each group is going to have someone that they kind of see as the leader mm -hmm. and that could change right you could be the leader at work in one in one situation and you go to another situation and you may not be the leader um someone who could be the leader at their corporate job when they go to church and they're in a group in the church they may not be the leader in that group but that doesn't mean that they're not a, they don't have a dominant personality mm -hmm. right and so I think that the problem is men get very upset. Some men, not all, get very upset, and they think that that means that a woman is not leading, is not willing to follow them, or is taken away from their position. But it's it's just to me it's asinine because if you look in the animal kingdom, the lion does not feel intimidated by the fact that there is one of the women, one of the lionesses in his pride that is leading the pride. In fact, he appreciates her because she's able to add organization, right? And so that is. That, to me, that's that's the, the definition of alpha female. It's a woman that has leadership qualities. It doesn't mean that she's a leader in every area that she comes into, but she does have very obvious leadership qualities, and she's driven by wanting to do well at them, right? There are some people that have leadership qualities but don't care to do that. They don't mm -hmm. want to do that, and so that would not be an alpha personality. Um, but an alpha personality is someone that has leadership qualities and is driven by the desire to want to, to, to exceed and do well in that, right? That's not a negative thing, it's not a positive thing. It's just a definition of personality type. Mm -hmm. So my book is titled Dear Alpha Female, It's Not Him, It's You. Because what I learned is that in that personality type, um, if you are a leader and if you do have the ability to um, convince others and be driven to do well, those characteristics can do great in the workplace but they also could be difficult when it comes to relationships 
and that's what the book is titled so people get really upset about the title the first part of the title because we don't like to read the first part of the title is dear alpha female it's not him it's you and then the second part is it's an interactive devotional designed to help you attract the love you deserve mm -hmm. i believe that everyone deserves love but i do think that because of the way that our culture is set up when a woman is very um, uh, um, aggressive when it comes to business which is a good thing right if you're a VP of a, of a department you have to be willing to stand up you have to be willing to speak your mind and vocalize what you believe and not allow someone to push you around but those qualities often when we are not in a situation that has been uh, loving we haven't been in a loving environment or we haven't been in a healthy environment those qualities can often become um, kind of warped and can make it very difficult for us to exist in a relationship. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. Right so down. we know in the, in the black community specifically, a lot of times women have had to be the head of household. Right. I don't think that was ever a choice. I think a lot of times if a, mayor, if, a, if a relationship goes bad or something happens and we know everything that happened, we don't have to go into that. We know what happened in our past mm -hmm. with slavery and the fact that the men was, was often taken out of the house. The woman was left by herself on purpose not by design, I mean by design by the people that enslaved us, right? Mm -hmm. So we understand that it was set up for many times these, these houses that were initiated all this trauma, it wasn't the man's decision to leave. It wasn't because he didn't want to be a father, he didn't want to be a husband. In many of these cases he was taken from the family and the woman was forced to be the head of the family. So with that being the foundation of the African American experience here, right? Then you have those women that have taught their daughters that in case there's no man in this household, you have to be able to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to lead. You have to be able to provide, right? So our experience is different than anyone else in this country when it comes to that. So I think that's another reason why when it comes to black men and black women, it's a very different, we have a very different like foundation. We have a very different cultural cultural issues that other people are not dealing with because there are not other cultures that saw the man raped in front of his wife to emasculate him mm. you know the man beat and so the wife had to keep her mouth shut because she didn't want to make it worse for him she couldn't cry because she didn't want him to feel hurt right but she also you know was left alone with the children anytime um, another child was born a lot of times I mean, all times the wife was raped and the husband had to swallow his pride because mm -hmm. if he said something, he would be killed. So all these issues that were birthed into us have been passed down genetically, right? So you have black women that have taught their children, their daughters specifically, that they have to be able to take care of their homes. I feel like that's where the beginning, I have this thing where I talk when I do conversations in the book, what birthed your alpha? Where did your alpha start? For a lot of us, that's where our alpha started generations ago. That's an interesting title. Where does the alpha start? Where did your alpha? Yeah, because where did that personality begin? And for a lot of us, it was born out of survival, right? Mm -hmm. I have to. Dad is not here. Now, when you go into the 50s and 60s, you see when women first start entering the workplace, a lot of times African-American men weren't able to get, black men weren't able to get jobs, right? It, it, we understand racism has played a part in all of our existence here in this country. And so if the woman was able to get a job and the husband was not, imagine his frustration and not being mm -hmm. able to provide, right? So he can't, he can't say anything. The woman has to say, you got you to gotta do what you got to do to my daughter. You got to do what you got to do. You got to take care of the situation. And that did build a dynamic between women and men as time went on that was very much like, I got to be able to take care of myself if you're here or if you're not. Indeed. So that makes a man feel like, well, what is my point? And it's a lot, it go, it's very deep, but I think this whole idea, specifically when it comes to black men and black women, is not very surface, it's very deep. But my point in writing this book is not to address all of that, it's to address the fact that at this point in 2024, we know that black women have amazing advantages and we are brilliant. You talked about black girl magic. Indeed. I am honored to be a part of, of this, this sorority of just amazing women of color. Right? I look around and every woman that I'm around, from my partner that owns the shop that we're in, to other uh, friends that I have that are just amazing business women, they're doing amazing things, right? Mm -hmm. Because they were taught, we've been taught from generations ago. My grandmother worked for the post office and was always telling me, Crystal, you're smart, you can do whatever you want. We've been taught for generations that we are able to achieve, we're able to succeed, right? 
Now, what we haven't been taught is this, the skill set to love and nurture a man and let go of that fear that he's going to be ripped from the house or that he's going to choose to leave because he doesn't feel like he's able to provide in the way that we want. We haven't been taught any of those skills, right? We've been, we're overly exposed and overly educated on how to get ahead when it comes to finance and come to to get setting yourself up with your portfolio and your home and buying real estate oh, we, we we're, we're doing this in a, at a rapid pace like i said the statistics show that black women are the highest level of new business small business owners so we're doing well in those areas but when it comes to loving a family and and under and making a safe place for a man we don't we have not been taught those skills so it. we have to learn so if it is it, it, just because you're good in one situation is not in one area doesn't mean you're going to be good in all areas and just like you put the work in to get your degree and to get your professional achievements you put the work in to learn all those things you have to put the work in to learn this other side as well and sometimes just allowing yourself to acknowledge that you do want love right you do want something that's different than that can't be achieved with a paycheck right that is something that feeling, allowing ourselves to be vulnerable is something we don't have much experience in doing because our culture, women have never been able to do that. Our men have never been able to do that. But now we don't have to keep running. We don't have to keep fighting, right? Mm -hmm. It's time to sit back and say, okay, now we're here. How do we change this? And that's what this book is about. Indeed, okay. So uh, for the people out there, for the subscribers, by the way, everybody, if you're out there and you're watching, please make sure you find ringside on facebook if you're on facebook make sure you go up to that search bar type in ringside llc request to join the private facebook group and either myself or one of the admins will admit you for the subscribers out there watching how can they find this book you know um is it on amazon you're a best-selling author so. it is on amazon it is at walmart it's at barnes and noble any place you go all you got to do is put in dear alpha female and it's going to pop up um and you can also reach out to me um on, on the website um, but yeah, the book is everywhere, right? And I actually have a part two that's coming out. Um, All right, sequel. I'm, yes, well, so yeah, I'm just gonna, it's a series and I'm gonna keep doing them because I relate to these women. Like I said, all my tribe, the females around me are amazing women that are leaders. And we don't, we don't shirk away from that. We don't, you know, we don't deny who we are, but I think that we also have the ability to be amazing lovers, to be amazing friends, to be amazing wives. And just because you need help in one area doesn't mean that you're not fit to do it, mm -hmm. right? And I think there, you know, there has to be teaching for men as well because I think there's, there is the equivalent to this book for a man, right? So I don't know how to write that because I'm not a man, and so I didn't want men saying, "Well, she does." I don't know. I don't know I the don't answers. Know talk to me. I don't know the man. answers. All I know is that we want to love you all, and that there are women that are very successful but also want to be able to be loved, and also want to be able to give love. And just because they may not have had the opportunity to see that does not mean that they don't desire that and that they don't have the ability to do that. And I think that we all do. And I think that was the beautiful thing about my conversation with Ebony K. Williams. She's someone I look up to, extremely talented, extremely, uh, um, you know, very uh, award winning and has done all these things, accolades that are amazing. Um, but at the end of the day, she still wants to be loved. Right. She still she still is a, as a, like a scared little girl in there. And I think that's beautiful that she was able to acknowledge that. Um, but we have to be able to move past our pain. And the first thing that we do is to acknowledge, okay, yes, I've been able to get myself here. And if, I, if I've been able to get myself here, then that proves that I have the ability to do it. I must, there must be something that I'm not doing right if I'm failing in this other area, mm -hmm. right? And I think self-accountability is key with everything. I was talking to a woman the other day. Um, and I said, my husband was getting on my nerves, right? I'm a newlywed, we've been married, my second marriage, we've been married for three years, going on four. And okay. I said, he's getting on my nerves. And she said, no. She said, you're getting on your nerves. She said, it's not him, it's you. And I was like, whoo, whoo. She just, she just told the author her book. <laughs> but you know what? Instead of saying, I, it did sting, but I, I said, why do you say that? And she said, well, has he changed since you married him? And I was like, no. She said, so you married him, this is who you chose, this is who he was, and you chose to marry him. I said, yes. She said, so did you want him to change? Did you expect him to change? And I said, mm, you can't expect anyone to change. So you came in a situation with someone that you knew was this way, and now you're saying they're getting on your nerves. She said, you're getting on your own nerves. Well, because not, you are expecting, you. yeah, it's not him, it's you. And, and you know what? She was right. 
She was right. Mm. I, li I love it. I love it. Everybody, don't trip. We're going to put the, the link in the description, so you ain't got to work that hard. We're going to have um, your social media and the link to the book. So we're doing the hard work. We're doing the leg work for you. So all you got to do is go down the description. Make sure you read the description, and you'll find the links to her book as well as for her social media and all her contact. Because, again, I hope I really want to get you back in front of the camera because I think we have a lot more to discuss. I really think that uh, I'd love to get a part two of um, the book, you know, I want to get you on camera because again, I think you have a lot of great information and a lot of my subscribers are women mm -hmm. and I think they can certainly benefit. You know, for me as a man, now for a female, it's never bothered me. I'm not, I've never been intimidated by powerful women. I'm actually turned on. Okay. Like I'm one of those men, I've, I've been very vocal and it's out there on social media right now. I've been, I've said, I'm like, I'm turned on by women like that. I'm like, that's just me. That's just my, my little thing. But anyway, everybody, Thank you so much for tuning in. Ms. Jordan, thank you thank so you. much for climbing inside the ring. Absolutely. And you have been awesome. Everybody out there, make sure you like, comment, share, and most importantly, and I can't stress this enough, most importantly, please subscribe. This is Ringside's very own Corner Confessions. I'm Trey Amazing, and we are out. Yeah.